Okay, so we were going to have a break, but then we decided if the morning session didn't have a break, then you guys couldn't get a break during this session. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a small break in the room. Um, if anybody has to go to the bathroom, not allowed. Uh, no, now would be the time to slip out, but what we are going to do is actually have an experience where we're gonna, I'm going to try and bring together, unify what both of these distinguished thinkers have said, which is to say you're going to experience retronasal olfaction and the molecular neurochemistry of flavor. Um, you're also going to have a genuine cultural experience. Uh, it's going to be like you're transported to Mexico. I think Italo Calvino will agree that what you're about to eat is but as authentically Mexican as it can get. Um, so if we can advance to the next presentation, but we're all gonna stand up right now, and from this side, my right, your left, you're gonna be receiving plain tortilla chips. Do I have that right? And then from this side, your right, you're gonna be receiving the authentic Mexican food I mentioned, Doritos. Everyone knows what a Dorito is, right? Okay, so I want you to get one in each hand. I don't want you to eat them yet. We're all gonna eat them at the same time. Perfect, yeah, I'll, I'll grab that. It, anyone here never had a Dorito before? Show of hands, one. I've had too many. Too many. Okay, does anybody not have both chips yet? Okay, still, so we're almost there. Don't eat them, gotta hold them. You guys can sit down if you want. You guys can sit, sit if you want. Okay, we there yet? Everyone, okay, so what I want you to do, pick up the Dorito, don't eat it, I want you to smell it with your nose. So that's called what Gordon was referring to as orthonasal olfaction. So that is the normal type of smelling, the smelling that we all think of. But what many of us don't realize is that the sense of smell plays an extremely important role when we eat, that is retronasal olfaction, which is to say, when the flavor compounds go in your mouth, they go back down your throat and up through that little hole and into your nose. So let's start by eating the plain tortilla chip. So everybody eat the plain tortilla chip. Not now, now. <laughs> okay, now eat the Dorito. So much of what you're experience, experiencing is the difference that aroma makes. So when we were talking this morning about the flavor companies where they make aromas and they make flavors, it's the same thing. They use the same chemicals. Much of what we experience in food, it's impossible to say how much, is actually aroma. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about today. So everyone can sit down and we will continue with the next part of our presentation. Um, and I, I want to ask you guys, be a little bit interactive. What do you think of, what do you think is our biggest problem? I'm being very clever in asking this question because the question contains the answer. It's almost a pun. What is our biggest problem? Our biggest problem is obesity. About a year ago, the world sort of tipped over this point where more people eat too much than don't have enough to eat. So it really has become our biggest problem globally. In the United States in 1960, the obesity rate was 13.4%. Today, it's 36%. If you add the cohort of the obese in the United States with the over, over, merely overweight, it's more than two-thirds of the population. Where I live in Canada, it's, obesity is 29%, slightly less, but if you add it with the overweight, it's 70%. And this is becoming increasingly the typical picture in the Western world. Denmark, obesity is at 18.2%. This might strike you as alarming, but this is actually really good news because in Sweden, it's 18.6%. <laughs> thought, thought you'd want to hear that. So we are now this big. This is how it looks over time when you look at obesity as a percentage of the American population. It is 
Obesity has become, in North America, the second leading cause of preventable death. Smoking is still number one. Smoking still kills more people unnecessarily, even though we've been fighting a war against it for 50 years, than anything else. But obesity is second, and obesity is actually our first leading cause of preventable morbidity. That is to say, disease. Obesity is making more people sick and unhappy than smoking. Smoking is just killing more people. <laughs> so how do we get this way? Everybody's got a theory, right? For a long time, we thought fat was the problem. And then we realized about in the 90, late 90s that you could actually eat as much fat. It'll never make you fat. Does anyone think, what, is, what do people here think, I'm curious, in Denmark about fat? Can you get fat by eating fat? Does anyone think eating fat can make you fat? Combined with carbs, but on its own, it can't make you fat, right? So if I were to continue eating the diet that I eat, and I ate a pound of butter every night before bed, would I get fat? I would. Okay, so maybe fat can make you fat. How about carbs, right? Carbs, they're terrible. They're poison, right? Depends on the carbs you eat. Depends on the carbs you eat. So here's something interesting. If you want to make an animal fat, what do you feed the animal? Carbs. You feed them corn, you feed them wheat. You could feed them fat, but it's too expensive, and it's difficult to store, so that's why we feed them carbs. Well, I want you all to think about a different approach to this problem, and I want to start that by telling you a story. It's the story of a guy named Arch West. So in the late 1950s, Arch West was a Madison Avenue ad man. Has anyone here seen the show Mad Men? Yep. Okay, so Arch West could have walked right off that show. He worked on Madison Avenue, he worked on the Campbell Soup account, he worked on the Jell-O Puddings account, and in 1960, he was poached by the Frito Company down in Dallas, Texas, to come and be their vice president of sales and marketing. Frito made little corn chips, and Arch West went down there to be in charge of sales and marketing. Shortly after he got there, it merged with the Lay's Chip Company to, a to become a company many of you have probably heard of, Frito-Lay. So in 1961, Arch West took his family on a trip to Southern California. He packed his wife and three kids, into a Lincoln Continental, there was no third row of seats, and they made it all the way to California, where Arch had a very interesting experience. Two things interesting took place there. The first is that he was staying at the home of a guy named Lawrence Frank, who invented, invented something called Lowry's Seasoning Salt. I don't know if any of you have heard of it here, but in North America, it's something most people have heard of. But even more interesting is one day, they decided to take a trip down to San Diego. And as they were driving down, they passed a little Mexican shack by the side of the road. And this is the kind of place that Arch West just had to stop. And he stopped, and he tasted for the first time a tortilla chip, just like you guys tasted today. And he was struck with a vision, and that was that tortilla chips are gonna be the next big thing for Frito-Lay. So he went back to Dallas, Texas, he presented this to his fellow executives, and they just sort of looked at him a little funny, because they thought, why would we sell tortilla chips when we already sell corn chips? They're practically the same thing. But Arch West was so confident in the future of tortilla chips that he actually funneled discretionary funds into an off-site facility to develop the tortilla chip concept. He even gave them a name in a horribly bastardized version of a pigeon Spanish that meant little pieces of gold. They were called Doritos. And he brought this concept back to his fellow executives and this time he got the green light. So, Frito-Lay, in the mid-1960s, released the snack that you were probably thinking changed everything, Doritos. Well, in fact, they changed nothing, because these Doritos bombed. They were just like that salted tortilla chip you tasted, which is to say, they tasted like a salted corn chip. And in the southwest of the United States, where there was a sort of a Mexican population and a, elements of Mexican culture, people knew that these things were great to dip in guacamole or salsa or a bean dip. Everyone else couldn't really figure it out. And the main complaint was, this snack sounds Mexican, but it doesn't taste Mexican. So Arch West had to go back up in front of this group of executives that he deceived, that he'd hoodwinked into greenlighting his product, and they said, what are you gonna do about Doritos? And this is when Arch West said the sentence that would change the world. He said, let's make them taste like taco. And he was laughed at, he was jeered. One of his fellow executives said, you don't know the difference between a thing and a flavor. And it was actually a very good point, because up until that time, things had their own flavors. If you wanted to experience the authentic taste of fried chicken, you had to make fried chicken. If you wanted to taste the, the authentic taste of cherry, you had to get cherries. There were flavorings back then, but they were extremely crude. You might buy something like a spice extract, which was pretty much the spice minus the fiber, or you might, they had very, very crude chemical flavorings that didn't really taste convincingly like 
let's say, the banana or cherry that they're trying to make. But Arch West knew that there was new technology. He probably knew this through his friend Lawrence Frank that meant you could make anything you wanted taste like whatever you wanted it to taste like. He knew that you could make a salted tortilla chip taste like taco just by adding chemicals. And that's what you experience today when you tasted those Doritos as you experienced chemicals. And I think there's nothing inherently wrong with chemicals, everything is a chemical. But what it tells us is the power of flavor technology to make humans eat. It took a snack that people did not want to eat and turned it into a snack that people literally could not stop eating. And we've all had that experience when you're at a party and there's a bowl of potato chips and you eat one and you can't stop yourself from eating another. So that's what I want to talk to you today is about Doritos not so much that Doritos are the problem, but they're the template for what happened to all of our food. So let's talk about the corn chip itself. In the mid-1960s, the corn that they were using was actually quite different already from the corn that the Frito company had been started with in 1932. In 1932, yield for corn was 27 bushels per acre. That means in a single acre of land, you got, generally speaking, about 27 bushels of corn. By 1967, that was already 80.1 bushels of corn, which is a phenomenal growth in productivity. Now we're up to about 170. Think about that, from 1932 to 2014, from 27 to 170. Orange yields have gone from 100, 176 boxes per acre to 328. Strawberry yields, 84, 100 weight per acre to 720. Well, we all know that, right? Because now you buy one of those big, luscious looking strawberries at the supermarket, and it tastes like water. Same thing with tomatoes, 2,700 weight per acre to 315. Is there anything more disappointing than the modern supermarket tomato? So we all know that flavor's gone out the window, right? Well, the question is, what is the cost of this incredible growth in productivity? And it's a question we rarely ask. We, we have to be honest that this is an important growth, that we wouldn't be here if not for this growth in agricultural productivity, because we have far less farmland than we used to have, and we have far more mouths to feed. In the developing world, they refer to this as the Green Revolution, and it literally saved lives. But has there been a cost to it? Well, a guy named Donald Davis, who's a, I guess you could say, a biochemist nutritionist uh, at the University of Texas, looked at this. He compared crops grown in 1950 to crops grown in 1999, and he looked to see if there was any difference in the nutrients. There had been some scientific literature that said that the nutritional density of whole foods was going down. But the research wasn't perfect, so Don Davis is a stickler for detail. Uh, he's very good with stats, and he said, let's do the definitive study to see if there is a difference. Because even the USDA, the American, with the United States Department of Agriculture, had publicly said, there's nothing to worry about here, folks. And Don Davis wondered, well, maybe there is, so let's have a look at it. And he found, in fact, there is. Overall, micronutrients are going down. Calcium's down by 16%, riboflavin's down by 38%, Iron's down by 15%. This is in the whole foods we grow. These are the foods that are supposed to be wholesome, and they're getting less wholesome. Well, this all makes sense, right? Because we talked about how bland the tomato is and how bland the strawberry is. But there's a problem with what I've told you so far, and that's that nutrients have no flavor on their own. The only nutrient that has flavor that was measured by Don Davis is vitamin C, which is sour. So if anything, produce got less sour by 15%, which isn't exactly terrible news. But there is a flavor story as well, and that's because of this guy named Harry Klee. He studies tomatoes at the University of Florida. Um, Harry, in the late 1980s, was hired by Monsanto to create a genetically modified tomato that tasted better. And they decided they would do this by making the tomato ripen slowly, so that it could start to ripen on the vine, and then they could pack it into boxes. Because what they'd been doing previously was just picking them. Those are not Granny Smith apples, those are tomatoes. That's how green they are when they pick them. And what they do is they send them to factories like this, and then they fog them with ethylene gas when it's time to send them to the supermarket. And that's what makes the tomato look red, but of course it doesn't taste that way. So they thought, well, if we can just get the tomato to start ripening on the vine, our flavor problems will go away. And that's what Harry Klee did, uh, one of the first people to produce and design a genetically engineered food, and it failed. Because that slow ripening tomato that ripened halfway on the vine and then sat in a box and ripened the rest of the way just tasted marginally better than these green tomatoes. So at that point, Harry Klee left the University of Florida, and he devoted himself to studying, to cracking the riddle of tomato flavor. And what he found is that essentially we've bred the flavor right out of tomatoes. Tomatoes don't know how to be flavorful anymore. If you look at these two, where is this? Oh, that was wrong. 
Well, if you can see the top row there, there's uh, the very far right is the odor threshold, and the two to the left are two different varieties of tomato. One's called Florida Dade, and one's called Sarasiform, which is a very old heirloom tomato. And you can see, as you go down the list of flavors, the concentration keeps going down. So what happened is not that anybody wanted there to be bland tomatoes. It's that we kept growing tomato plants to be more disease resistant, to produce tomatoes that, like with a thicker skin so you could pack them in a box and send them to a supermarket and they wouldn't all be mush by the time they got there. But more than anything, we wanted tomato plants that produced a ton of tomatoes. And every time we made one of these decisions where we prized this trait over another trait, we got that trait. And the problem is if you don't select a trait, you lose that trait. It's the same reason we lost our tails. It's reverse evolutionary pressure. And over decades of breeding tomatoes to meet the needs of the supermarket, tomatoes literally forgot how to be flavorful. Well, Harry Clean measures flavor with a machine called a gas chromatograph. And that's also really important because that tells us how we've lost flavor, but it also tells us how the flavor story changed. The very first gas chromatograph went on sale in the mid-1950s. Up until that point, scientists really had no idea why food was flavorful. We knew an awful lot back then about vitamins and things like amino acids. We had no clue about flavor. You, scientists could look at an orange or a cup of coffee and just scratch their head as to why it tasted the way it did. Because flavor compounds come in such minute quantities that they're measured in parts per million, sometimes parts per billion, even parts per trillion. Well, the gas chromatograph changed that. Now you could volatize a substance and it would go inside this big long tube and it would separate everything out. So then the flavor compounds would come out the other end and then we could figure out what these flavor compounds were. And it didn't take long before we figured out what flavor compounds were, then we got in our heads, hey, we can start making these. And that's what we do, we make flavors in factories. There are hundreds of flavor factories all over the world. And that's what was put in the original taco flavored Doritos. You can see it on the ingredient panel, flavorings. Well, here's a question we never ask. Why does food have flavor anyway? Air doesn't really have a flavor. Air is essential to life, but air just, it's air. It doesn't have any qualities other than it quenches your desire for air when you inhale. But what about food? Food has such a variety of flavor. Gordon told us that the act of experiencing flavor occupies more gray matter than anything else a human can do. So what's it doing there? Evolution must have thought it was really important if it gave us this incredible ability to literally savor and in some sense analyze and experience the food that we're eating. We talked this morning about the smell of fresh cut grass. Maria mentioned that. That's a flavor compound. It's in the hexanol family. But there's a particular one called cis-3-hexanol, which if you ever smell, if you go to a flavor company, it smells like fresh cut grass. It's intense. It smells like carrot juice because in fact, carrots have this chemical compound. But what's really interesting is when entomologists when the scientists who study insects talk about cis-3-hexanol, what they will tell you is that this is actually a plea for help. If a caterpillar starts eating a corn plant, the corn starts releasing, releasing cis-3-hexanol, and that sends out a signal to parasitic wasps to come and eat the caterpillar. So in nature, you can think of flavor as information. And I think it's information for us as well. Why is this cow eating a rabbit? Why is this deer eating a rabbit? The reason they're doing that is because they're deficient. They're experiencing a deficiency, most likely in phosphorus, a mineral deficiency. And what ruminants do is they start to suck and eat old bones. There's some part of their mind that knows that when they feel this way, this is the food they should go out and eat. Uh, I talk about in my book a scientist named Fred Provenza, who's at Utah State University, who's in the tradition of many distinguished psychologists, uh, Kurt Richter, uh, John Garcia, uh, Paul Rosen, who's here, has done similar work. He's a fascinating guy, you should, someone definitely to talk to. Fred would do experiments where he would make sheep deficient in a particular mineral, and then he would pair a flavor with an intergrastic burst of that mineral. He did one where he made sheep deficient in phosphorus, and he would give them the flavor of coconut, and then he'd put phosphorus in their stomach. And then the next day, he'd give them the flavor of maple, and then he'd put water in their stomach. And what he found was that eventually, they associated the flavor of the coconut with the phosphorus and their, the amount of coconut feed they consumed was inversely proportional to their blood level of phosphorus. The flavors they craved met their nutritional needs. Now you might think, well maybe, maybe sheep just like coconut, 
But in another pen, he reversed it, where he paired the maple with the phosphorus. And those sheep preferred the maple. When British sailors were suffering from scurvy, and the British Navy struggled for decades to figure out how they could prevent this, how they could cure it, the sailors would speak of a yearning for fruits and vegetables. It even had a name, it was called scorbutic nostalgia. And it was different than regular nostalgia, it was different than just missing home, in one important way, because when they turned the ship around and said, we're, sa we're sailing back home, the sailors who just had plain old nostalgia, who just missed home, it went away, because they knew they were going home. But the sailors had scurvy, it didn't go away. They still craved fruits and vegetables. James Lind is the British doctor who figured out that citrus can cure scurvy. And he wrote in his notes that the distinguished doctor knows what the ignorant sailor, which is that the cure for scurvy are the vegetable and fruit productions of the earth. Now, this is a very tricky thing to prove in humans because we can't do the kind of test that Fred Provenza does with animals. But his, this guy, Harry Klee, came up with some of the most compelling, inf uh, compelling new information as to the reason we like the flavors that we like. And I'm going to go back to this chart because we have there on the very left the volatile, that's the flavor compound, and then we talk about concentration. But the interesting thing there is that middle column that says precursor. Because in the early 2000s, Harry Klee had realized that there's about 26 flavor compounds in tomatoes that really drive our liking. These are the things that make our eyes light up and go, wow, that's a great tomato. There's hundreds of flavor compounds we can recognize, but the brain just seizes on these 26. And then he thought, well, if I can figure out how the tomato's making those flavors, I can breed tomatoes that are gonna be flavorful. And when he deduced the chemical pathway, the enzymatic pathway by which tomatoes make their flavor, what he found is that in every case of those 26 compounds, the precursor is an essential nutrient. Things like omega-3 fatty acids, which you've probably heard of, or beta -carot carotenoids, which we use to make vitamin, e, uh, vitamin A or amino acids. So you can think of the flavor of a tomato as being a chemical sign that tells your brain there's good stuff here. And this is an interesting way to think about what Gordon and David were talking about, because we see both the value of flavor to the body, but also flavor as signifying something essential in the object. And that's what we've changed. That's what technology, not that I'm an enemy of technology, but that's what it's done. It gave us an opportunity to cleave something, something that had always been associated in nature. Suddenly, we had the ability to make anything we wanted to have the zip and tang of a tomato, ketchup-flavored tomato, potato chips. You can see there, just like the, those old Doritos, flavor. It sounds innocuous. That's what makes soft drinks soft drinks, is flavorings. We, we talk about soft drinks being bad because of all the sugar. We think the sugar is reinforcing, but the truth is, if the supermarket aisles were filled with bottles of sugar water, nobody would drink them. It's the flavor that makes it delicious. You can find flavor in everything. It's in butter now. They add flavor to butter to make it taste cultured, even though it isn't cultured. They add flavor, if you look at the ingredients of a pork shoulder, maybe not here, but certainly in the United States, you will find that they add flavoring, because the pork industry is so efficient at producing fat animals so quickly that it doesn't taste like pork anymore. So they add the pork flavor back in. They add flavoring to dried cranberries. They add flavoring to grilled salmon. It even says with grill flavor. <laughs> they add flavoring to yogurt. You think a lot of the yogurt you eat has fruit in it, but the truth is it just has a little bit of fruit in it to convince you that there's fruit there. And then they add coloring and flavoring, and then you bite it or your child eats it, and they think, hmm, that tastes like cherry. In some cases, there's no fruit in yogurt at all. It's just flavoring. There's flavoring in chicken. In short, this is the template that so much of our food has become, which is to say, a vehicle to carry flavor that we've imposed. The real wholesome foods that were growing on farms are less nutrient dense, but even more importantly, less flavorful than they used to be. And we have the power to make anything we want taste like whatever we want. So maybe when we think about junk food and the obesity epidemic, we need to think not so much about what's in the food, but how we're fooling ourselves. So that I think, I think it's important because there is a practical level to everything we're talking about. So many of us here are, come to a conference like this because we love to eat. All humans love to eat. All humans are wired to love to eat. And flavor nourishes us and it, it excites us, but we don't often pause to think about how we've corrupted our food environment with flavor. So that ends my portion of the discussion, and what I'd like to do now is talk with Gordon and David. What I particularly want to get back to is this idea of whether flavor is in the thing 
or flavors in the brain, because that's a tension, I think, in both of your talks that you address to some degree, but I'm hoping we can settle it forever. <laughs> so um, who, who wants...